my aching back. How many times have you heard a gardener say that? You know, there seems to be an opinion that if you don't ache at the end of the day, you haven't been working hard. But gardening doesn't have to be painful. I'm Barbara Damrosh. And I'm Elliot Coleman. Stay with us for the next half hour, and we'll show you how to garden without hurting yourself. And we'll introduce you to a woman who's still gardening actively in her 90s. On Gardening Naturally. I both feel that gardening is a wonderful way to keep healthy and fit. Now, we're in our 50s, and I feel pretty good. How about you, Elliot? No, I'm not doing so bad. The whole key to it is to be able to figure out how to do your garden work enthusiastically without paying for it later. And to help us learn something about that, we've invited over our friend Diana Richardson. Diana teaches preventive health care, and she's going to teach something to us. Hello, Diana. Hi, Elliot. Great to see you. Hi, Barbara. You know, the thing that I hear most from gardeners is, oh, my aching back. It seems to be mm -hmm. the thing that goes first. Mm -hmm. How can you prevent that? Don't garden. No. <laughs> uh, you can prevent that by knowing, first of all, that this is the part of you that is the center of gravity, and let it be the center of your balance. And keeping your upper body close over the center of balance and moving from here will solve that problem. That's one thing all athletes learn, is yeah. to keep in balance right. there. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I'm going to lean down to pick something, I'm going to extend my leg, right, and bend, keeping my back straight, rather than going like this. Mm -hmm. Keeping my back straight and using the strong part of my body to lift or pick something or weed something, and then actually come back over okay, my center so of gravity. if I were to pick this up, instead of going like this, to putting this ring on my back like that. Yeah, don't do that. I should go like this. And sort of gradually get it up like this. Yeah, only here's one thing I'd show you. Put that down as fast as you okay. can, Barbara, because it's pretty heavy. When you come down and getting close, just as you did, then you want to keep these arms straight mm -hmm. because this part is not the strong part. This is. So okay. gonna, I'm going to kind of lean back onto my legs, keep my arms straight, whole body. So you see that my arms are loose, my shoulders are relaxed, there's no strain on my upper body. And in fact, I'm just getting a good stretch mm. for my arms. Nice. So, keeping, again, that back towards my center of gravity. And, incidentally, using your whole body does mean being aware of using your breathing as well. So, for example, when I pick that up, I inhale. When I set it down, I exhale. And that's a, then a whole fluid motion. Well, you know, talking about inhaling and exhaling, maybe you don't have to inhale so much when you fill this bucket up. Just because it's a bushel, it doesn't need to hold a bushel. That's right. If, mm. uh, if you don't have to pick up a heavy object, don't. If you can make two trips, that's always much smarter. Mm. Now, uh, right. something I've learned as a farmer when I'm working in the field is I'll put an elbow down here so I can sort of create a triangle and lean on it when I'm working. It supports mm -hmm. me better. Are there any other tricks you've learned that would help me when I'm doing that? Yeah. Sure, that's a good point. In fact, I'd add to that just simply that you keep moving when you're down low, right? Just mm. even if you're kind of walking like this, squatting and oh, so, so forth. Oh, so the same muscle isn't under strain the whole time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Bodies well, like to keep in motion. They lose. Right. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Right? Well, oh, yeah. I, I'm in this position a lot, too. Mm -hmm. I do an awful lot of weeding, close work, deadheading, and I find that if I stay in the same position too long, my knees will hurt at the end of the day. Mm. So, you know, I'll maybe start this way, and then I'll work like this for a while, and then like that, and then even switch like that, and that seems to help. Yep, that's a good idea. And also, why not change activities? After a short period of doing something where you're on, you know, bended knees a lot, mm -hmm. go and do something else where you're not doing that same kind of that's thing. That's a good idea. Yeah. Or even changing hands. I know if I'm using clippers, I've learned to use them with the left hand mm -hmm. also, so I balance the strain. Yeah, good idea. And by the same token, reaching across, instead of reaching out like this, uh -huh. using your other side gives a good stretch oh, yeah. to your whole body and helps keep you in balance also. 
Okay, now what about, how, what about the unfortunate time when you haven't paid attention to this and you are sore? Is there something to do then? Yes, but actually there's something you can do before that too. And that is to stretch. Use anything that you've got handy in the garden uh -huh. to stretch and incorporate that into your routine. So just get up from whatever you're doing over to a pole or anything like this. Sure, an old fence post. That's great. Yeah, and just lean. Oh, yeah, I can see how that would be comfortable. It is, and just take a couple of nice breaths and let them go, and good. Or to stretch out your back, lower back, and in fact, your whole back, the whole spine. Oh, there's looks, another that good looks one. Like a good one, yeah. Oh, that does feel good. Okay, That's now, amazing. what about I'm out in the field mm -hmm. and there isn't any fence post nearby? I'm working all day. Mm. What can I do then? Can you have that? Sure. This one for you, Barbara. It's a good stretch for your whole... Over my leg, head. Right. Stuck your... my arms straight. Yeah, stuck under. Okay. So you don't have a sway back. And just let your arms stretch back. Open your chest there. So this is during repetitive work like that, you take a stretch break. Yes, then. exactly. And not, it's, don't even need to think of it as an interruption, but just part of your routine. And you can be as creative as you can with it. So Anna makes gardening look like a ballet, doesn't she? Oh, I know. It's like combining an exercise program with actually getting something practical done. I love it. Well, if you pay attention to your body and how to use your whole body, then you actually can not only avoid fatigue and uh, possible injury, but increase your overall strength and muscle tone and endurance as well. It's the same thing athletes learn, that if they center the force in here, it's much more effective and they're better I athletes. Say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I sometimes forget about my body when I'm gardening. I'm either very focused on the weeding or whatever, or, or I get into that meditative state I sometimes have when I'm weeding, where I'm thinking about mm -hmm. something I'm writing or what I'm going to cook for dinner. And I should probably pay a little bit more attention to my body as I work. Mm. Well, I guess if you just think when you're working that whatever you're doing out there in front of you is coming from in here. And again, remember to keep your whole body involved, and that means paying attention to your breathing mm. as well. And making yeah. good connections. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diana. This has been a great help. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you. Thanks. Another factor to consider in the garden is protecting yourself against the sun. And Barbara and I recommend that at the least you wear a lotion with a sun protection factor of 10 or up to 15 and put it on those exposed parts of your body, like your nose and the tips of your ears, where you can really get burned by the sun. Yeah, I don't have to worry about the sun quite as much as Elliot does because I'm not as blonde. But that doesn't mean I can ignore it altogether. So I wear that goo, and I often will wear a hat. You know, that feels better already on a day like today. I like this one because it's sort of heavy and stays on my head. But there's lots of hats you can wear. You could be the gondolier gardener or the political gardener. How's that, Elliot? Now, there's a useless hat. <laughs> well, here's a useful one, okay? This one's great because it has a chin strap. And if it's very windy, you can garden without losing your hat. That's a good one. Now, if I were one of those lovely lady gardeners that could go out in a flowered dress with an elegant basket and pick roses, I would wear a hat like this. I wished I looked like that when I gardened. Uh, I'm more apt to look like this and go out on the tractor for one of these. Right. Instead of the fashion show, you really want to think of the hat as a way to protect yourself. This is your typical farmer's or feed store hat that you see a lot of people wearing. But nowadays, people are realizing that the bill isn't long enough, doesn't give you enough protection, and it isn't protecting your ears. The first step may be to wear a hat with a longer bill, like this one. And that's nice because it does come out here and shades your whole face. But maybe even better is a hat that comes down and shades ears, neck, and everywhere. Except the tendency is to wear a hat like this back so people can see your face. Well, if they can see it, soak in the sun. You really want to hunker into it. Or you could get stylish and wear a snazzy rain sun hat like this, roll up the sides, look like Crocodile Dundee. The only problem is the sun then can see your face. And pretty soon you'll look like a crocodile. <laughs> right. So the secret with all of these is to roll them down, look a little less stylish when you're in the garden, but you'll look a lot more stylish if you aren't burned by the sun afterwards. Oh, let's, let's go for style. Uh, this is you. Thank you, darling. <laughs>
I've walked down the road to visit an old friend of ours and gardening naturally, Helen Nearing. Helen is an active gardener at the age of 90 and a real testament to the fitness benefits of gardening. You know, Helen, when I think about getting old, it makes me very happy to think that you are 90 and you're still keeping your garden and taking care of your property, growing your own food, and that when you were in your 70s, you built this house out of stone. Why not if you feel up to it? You have the strength and then the vigor and the patience and the temerity. Why not? We've tell, done it. tell me a little bit about how the stone building works. I know you built the stone wall around your garden all by yourself, but with Scott's help. With his help. He, he calls it Helen's house. Uh, I was born and brought up a violinist, but I've become a lady stonemason. So uh, I like this kind of house. I've lived in Switzerland. I've lived in the Austrian Alps, and this mm -hmm. is the kind of house I like, and I like the balcony and it faces the morning sun, and there's a balcony that looks over the water and the, with the sunset. Why what not? part of the stonework was your job? Picking out every stone and laying every stone. Scott could mix the concrete in a wheelbarrow and hand it to me. Otherwise, I did it. That's wonderful. But what's the secret of the fact that at the age you've reached now, you can do all of these things so easily. I mean, I see you bouncing around the yard like a kid. How is it possible? A simple life. Always in the country, always up early, always to bed early, and a vegetarian diet. I eat no animals. I eat out of the garden, and I eat fruits and vegetables. And this last winter, I was entirely on raw food. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be done. And it's grown without chemicals, of course. Oh, it's organic. And then just the physical exercise itself, how much of that is a part of it, do you think? Well, people ask if I do calisthenics or so, or if I do yoga, I say, look, I bend and stretch and, and run and, and leap and drop and jump every, every day. So if you're growing your own food, the exercise just takes care of itself. Speaking of lifting, Helen, I noticed that your stone pile over there is growing. Are you still collecting stones? I can't resist a good stone when I see it. For what, I don't yet know, but give me time, and I may. So maybe the next time I come down here, you might be starting on another stone wall. I might. <laughs> you never know. If I bring in one of my garden tools looking like this, covered with mud or clay, and I put it away, I've really only half finished my garden work. I really ought to clean it off first for a number of reasons. The next time I use it, if I leave stuff stuck on here, it's going to be even harder to take off then. And if I don't get it off, it'll make it more difficult to press this tool into the soil, and it'll lessen my pleasure in using it. So I keep around simple cleaning tools, like this piece of wood. Just sharpen the edge, and then you can very easily scrape mud off the surface of your tools. If that doesn't quite do it, you can use a brush and brush them clean. And maybe just to be sure, keep an old rag around and just rub the last of it off. If there's any rust on your tools, you want to take that off also. And I like to use this. This is called a rust buster. It's a piece of rubber impregnated with grit. And in case there's any rust on there, especially on the exposed metal parts, you can just scrub it down with this and get it as clean as you'd like it. Now, I like to buy really good tools because I enjoy using them. If I also take care of them, my great-grandchildren are going to be able to enjoy using them also. Over the years, I've planted a lot of shrubs and trees when there's been nobody around but little me. So I've had to think up some tricks to move it without hurting me or hurting the plant. Now, I've got a fairly large viburnum in the truck right now. It's got a big root ball on it. And I'm just pushing it with my foot. You never want to roll a root ball because it can really break it up. You have to think of that root ball as just as delicate as you are. OK, I've got it pretty close to the plank where I'm going to slide it down now. You might be tempted to drop something like this on the ground. You won't want to do that. One thing, if you're holding it, it will suddenly 
give off a lot of weight that could really injure you, and it could also break up the ball. And you never want to do that. Okay, I'm going to see if I can just get this by rotating it a little bit. Onto the plank, there. Now I can maneuver it down to where I want it to go. Now, in this particular planting site, I could bring the truck up pretty close without a problem. On the other hand, if my planting spot were way across the lawn where I couldn't drive my truck, I'd put the end of my plank into a garden cart and slide it into that, then wheel it. Okay, ready to offload him. Now, I've got this within a few feet of where I'm going to plant it, but let's say I need to change my mind a little. No problem, I'll just gently rotate it inching it as I go. If you're trying not to strain your body while you're working in the garden, even subtle differences in tool design can make a big difference to you. Take these two hoes, for example. They may look about the same. They both have a small blade, but there is an important difference. This blade is attached to the handle at a 90 degree angle, and this blade is attached at a 70 degree angle, and that makes a lot of difference in how they're used. A 90 degree angle hoe is a chopping hoe, which means you're holding it with your thumbs down the handle, bending your back in order to chop, usually because you've let the weeds get too big and you really need to put some muscle into it. Now notice the bent back. A 70 degree angle is a skimming hoe because it's just the right angle to skim, which means you can now stand upright with your thumbs up the handle, and this is a much more comfortable working position. The only difference is it means that you have to keep a head on the weeds because you want to get them when they're small, which is the best way to do it because they're a lot less work. Also, this handle is longer because of the angle at which you're using it. In fact, the ideal handle length comes up to about the tip of your nose. For those who are uncomfortable with either of these options, there's a third possibility, the Dutch hoe, which is a push-pull hoe. And in this case, you have about a 35 degree angle in here. And this is meant for just holding out in front and skimming back and forth on the surface of the soil. I find in many conditions, if the soil is a little hard, this is an excellent hoe. On very soft soil, it may tend to sink in and dive. In the best designs of Dutch hoe, you want to make sure that there's a little pushing handle at the back end at just the right angle that your wrist is going to be able to put as much power into that with the least strain in order to do the job as easily as possible. With small hand tools, subtle differences in design are even more important because now we're dealing with smaller, weaker parts of your body, like your wrist. And wrist injuries are becoming very common today. Let's take these two scoops as an example. Now, this one is technically a grain scoop for dipping grain out of a bin and feeding it to your animals. And it's an excellent design for that because the handle is over where the, most of the weight is going to be. But if you were to use this for spreading lime or rock powders in the garden with this motion, it isn't as good because since your hand is forward, you don't get as much whip. This would be the tool for that with the handle at the back. Now when you're spreading lime, you can really wiggle it. Small difference, subtle difference, important when you use it. These two grass clippers look pretty much alike, and yet in this one, my wrist is straight up and down, and it's a perfect design for going along and clipping grass in this position. But if I want to go uh, an edge, say along the edge of this bed, notice my wrist has to be stressed in order to do that. And so this design is much more preferable, because in this case, my wrist is naturally in that position, and I can go along here and do it with absolutely no stress at all. Here are three trowels. Two of them look a little funny. This one is fairly common. Standard trowel, and yet if I dig a hole with it, notice how I have to bend my wrist back. This is actually quite uncomfortable in order to get that nice little hole. In this design, the handle has been put on at a right angle. Much more comfortable, but I use it differently. I now just press it into the ground and pull back toward me, and my wrist is not stressed in the process. Or if you like to make things at home like I do, this is a bricklayer's trowel. I cut the tip off, bent the handle back a little bit, and this can now be used in what I consider the most comfortable wrist position of all. I use it as a dagger. I put it in, pull back toward me. In each case, I've made an identical hole, but three different ways of using your wrist 
some of them with much less stress. And these hand hose. Now, I put these on a scale, and they both weigh the same in total weight, and yet there's a great difference in their effect on your wrist. This one has a little counterweight at the back end of the handle, and so it actually balances on my finger, and so when I'm holding it, there is no stress of the weight out here, and it's a very pleasant tool to use. In this case, all the weight of this tool is concentrated out there, and the whole time I'm holding it, my wrist is holding up that extra weight. This is a lot more stress on the body. Now, there's one final design, which is probably my favorite. I made this for a friend who injured a wrist. I took a piece of wire in the basement. I hammered the edge of it flat and just bent it around and stuffed it in an old file handle. It is very lightweight, and it enables anybody, even with an injured wrist, to do very effective, lightweight cultivating in the garden. You want to obviously get there while the weeds are small, but with almost no stress at all on your wrist. In gardening, as in any physical activity, it's important to drink plenty of fluids so you won't become dehydrated. You may not actually feel thirsty. You may not even be perspiring, especially if it's a windy day but you do need to drink plenty of liquids. And it's also a good excuse for sitting down and relaxing occasionally. For now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, get started on easy home projects that anyone can handle here on Home Bodies. Then indulge your creative side with Debbie Stapley on Crafts & Company TLC.